Oh, I'll give a wink in everything. Oh, Scott, this sounds good. What is the acronym? <laughs> no, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> so we have, we have time to wake up. In my world, it's still morning, so welcome to my world. Um, <laughs> it is. Okay. It's, I know it. Anyway, I'm Courtney Lottle. I am an attorney, and I am going to be doing Copyright 101. We are going to talk about a whole lot of copyright issues to get us all on kind of the same page. I will have some time for questions at the end, but I want to kind of get through some of the beginning stuff because from experience I have learned many of the questions that people want to ask right at the beginning. Seriously, I'm just about to get there. Let me get through it because if I can get to where I need us to get, then we can answer a lot more questions, okay? And I know that there will be some. I will leave time, I promise. Now, I teach this class at Emory, so I could actually talk for an entire semester. I promise I will not. Um, I do talk for entire semesters, but I promise I will not today. I've pared it down to stuff you gotta know, but obviously we're gonna move a little quickly and we're gonna leave out some stuff. Now, um, I'm an attorney, as I mentioned. I say this again because I've, one of the first lessons I'm gonna give you is please don't take legal advice from someone who isn't. Um, there are a lot of people out there. In fact, I could walk out into the hallway here and throw a rock and hit someone who knows everything. You know some of these guys. Um, or I could grab someone randomly and put them up here and they would probably tell you stuff about copyright law. Because we're just that kind of group, right? You know what? They won't know what they're talking about. You would know that because you saw me go out there and grab someone in a costume in here to talk to you. On the internet, you don't know that it's anyone any better at all, do you? So please, don't believe crap you read on the internet, because it is exactly that. Any legal advice, except for mine, that you get for free is worth exactly what you paid for it. I'll use an example I have started using with other people. How many of you have at some point in your life been kind of sick or injured? How many of you have gone to Google to find out what you maybe ought to do? How many of you should have been dead by now because you have a rare form of leukemia? Yeah, because anytime you Google those symptoms, usually there's some drug thing that someone has decided you need and they'll be happy to give you lots of ads for that for the rest of your bloody life, um, which probably will exceed the six months life expectancy they gave you on Dr. Google. So, just like Google cannot diagnose you, Google cannot help you with your legal problems. A lot of people write stuff up there that is just garbage. Some of them, I think, believe what they're saying, but that doesn't make it true. Some of them are writing stuff just to mess with you. I have found more and more stuff online that people have pointed me towards, which is not just wrong, it's so stupidly wrong that I'm certain they knew. I'm sure they're messing with you. So just don't believe that crap, okay? Most of it's wrong. And you guys will never know the difference between what's right and what's wrong. I go and look at some of them and say, well, it's sort of right, but not exactly. Well, you're not completely stupid, just malicious. You're just a moron. Um, I wasn't pointing at you, I was pointing at the end of you. An amazingly made up person on the internet over there. But you won't be able to tell the difference, so don't trust any of it. Um, <laughs> um, knowing that, the law that you need to know, is, some of it is inexplicable and murky, and some of it's fairly straightforward. I will point at the inexplicably murky stuff and say good luck with that. Um, but I'll tell you the straightforward stuff, okay? That's what we're doing today. To start with copyrights, I'm going to start with what we're not talking about. Let me steal your soda, please. This is the first thing we're not talking about. This is a trademark. When I hold this can up, every single one of you, Bob, sorry. Um, hey, I'm doing better. My first panel, I held my purloin soda up with my other hand and remembered why I'm having rotator cuff surgery in a few weeks. Um, that slowed the panel down for a moment. I hold this up. You all know what is in this bottle. You know exactly what's in this bottle, and it's not just because we're seriously in the shadow of the giant red tower. That's what the trademark is. It tells you what the good, what the service is. You know what to expect when you see the label or hear the name. That's trademark. It's actually interesting, but we can't go there for very long, in that it's really a consumer protection law. The point of trademark is not to let Coke continue to exploit their name in perpetuity. Their purpose is to make sure that when you buy soda in perpetuity, you will know what your soda is. That's the trademarks. Notice this is not a painting or a book. 
or even software. You want a picture of your cup? <laughs> okay, and I'll even give it back to you after you. I'm feeling this. So that's your trademark. Trademark is a brand, it's a company name, it identifies the source of the good or service. You cannot trademark your book, you cannot trademark your software, you cannot trademark your medical grade pharmaceuticals. Which gets us to another thing we're not talking about. Um, someone in here is an honest to God scientist. There's always one. Who, where's my scientist? Okay, there we go. If you invent something like really brainy that I wouldn't understand, a machine, drugs, chemicals, you invent something sciencey. That's a patent. That's a patent. And we're not talking about those at all today. Um, if you are getting advice on patents, please make sure you're getting it not just from a lawyer, but from a patent lawyer. They are a separate breed from the rest of us. There are most, okay, most people, you've known engineers and scientists, right? Most of them aren't really good with words. Um, my people, our standard line is if we were good at math and science, we'd be doctors. We say it because it's funny, but it's funny in a way that kind of makes us cry a little on the inside. But it's true. If you can do both, if you're one of those math and science people who are really good at words, you can be a patent lawyer. Excellent. You're a patent lawyer? No, I could be, but I am just decided I'm making enough money that I can why, Sweet. Why pay more why to school? Why go to school to mm -hmm. make, make the same, the same amount of money later yeah. after you pay off your debts? Yeah. Paralegal certificate was cheap. Scientists are smart. <laughs> um, so patents are your science things. You need a patent lawyer to give you advice on that. You cannot file your patent for yourself. The trademark, honestly, if you have a company name that you want to file, you can do that for yourself. USPTO.gov. Lots of FAQs, beginner forms. You can file your own copy, your own trademark. 350 bucks. It'll be annoying. You'll want to rip your hair out. You may need to call their reference attorneys for help. But you can do it. You can't do a patent. Don't even try. And I can't do a patent because I'm not a patent lawyer. My required science in college was astronomy. <laughs> this is a fun class. Satisfied the science requirement. I met some nice athletes. And it really wasn't that challenging. It was exactly what I wanted. I can't be a patent lawyer. Don't let someone who isn't a patent lawyer touch your patent, ever. If your invention is that cool that you want to go through the money and the expense and the effort of trying to patent it, don't get a patent agent, don't get a paralegal who knows stuff, don't get someone on the internet who files patents, for the love of God, get a patent lawyer. It'll be expensive, but find a human you can speak to who will work. It's worth it. So that's what we're not talking about. What we are talking about is copyrights. Copyrights are the creative stuff. Now in this room I know sometimes the creative stuff is software code. How many of y'all are programmers, coders? How many of you are like artists or writers or something else from the fluffy side of copyright? Okay, so we're about evenly split. Nice. Basically what I say applies to both. They're very different things. And one day I will do a panel on why copyright should never apply to software code. Um, it's a stupid, stupid, stupid idea, but it is the law. So we go with it. So what I'm going to tell you, I usually talk about books or art because that's where copyright usually is, but the same rules absolutely apply to software code. Go figure. So copyright is the creative stuff. One thing that people often think about it is that it's not protected unless you put that cute little C in a circle. C in a circle is not important anymore. I still recommend you do it, kind of like locking your car. If you park your car in downtown Atlanta, you know, you're, you're rolling the dice, right? If you park your car in downtown Atlanta with money on the back seat, <laughs> you're rolling the dice. If you lock the door, eh, you're keeping some honest people honest. So it's still going to put a mystery window and take cash. Don't be stupid. Um, but you're keeping honest people honest when you lock your car door, when you lock your house door, whatever. That's what putting a little C in the, court, in the circle does for you these days. It alerts people that, no, I own this and I don't want you to take it. And so some people who believe what they've read on the internet and think, oh, it was posted on the internet without a little C in the circle. That means I can take it. No, actually it doesn't. But if you can make those idiots realize they are stealing from you, hey, you've made a step. So put the little C on your work. It helps. Doesn't solve the problem, but it helps. As soon as you create your work, when you write the book, when you paint the painting, when you code your code, um, it is fixed in a tangible medium, that's our lawyer words, 
And that means written down. In the computer counts. Computer memory counts as fixed in a tangible medium. It's a thing now. It's not just an idea in my head. The idea in my head is not protectable. So when you come to say I have this great idea, I'm like, that's great. You can't protect it. The idea is not protectable. Even after you write it down, what's protected by copyright is what you've written down, not the idea embodied in it. Uh, I could draw a lovely horse. Someone in here has seen me do it already. Um, and I, I sold it. So cool. I'm an artist now. I, I drew a little sketch that is in the art show. So I sold it. And I'm now a professional artist because I sold a drawing for money at the Dragon Con art show. I rock. This is a really bad line drawing, just in case any of you are impressed. So if I draw that, that drawing is, by virtue of being drawn, protected by federal copyright law. Pretty spiffy. So I'm not just a professional artist, I'm a copyright artist. Woo! Yeah, my son's drawings are protected by federal copyright law, too. Um, so the minute you create it and write it down, it's protected. However, if you actually care about it, you need to register it. And the registration is not that hard. You can do this yourself. It's actually easier than a trademark. Um, Copyright.gov. Be careful when you go there. If you write .com instead of .gov, it will send you to any of a number of sites where they are very happy to take your money, and they may or may not file something. It, it, there's a lot of different scam sites that misdirect quickly. Be careful. Make sure you have gone to copyright.gov and that it's run by the Library of Congress. It's a fairly straightforward application. You have to tell them what it is. They will tell you how they want copies of it because they usually want a copy or two of it. If, depending on what the work is, they'll either want a digital, they'll want a hard copy. It varies. Last I heard, they were still expecting like the first 10 pages of your code to be printed out and mailed to them. It's kind of fun. Um, and I mean, we're talking object and source code, not just work. So you send them eight pages of ones and zeros, and they're happy, I suppose. Um, but if it's a ginormous sculpture, they don't actually want you to make a miniature and send it. They want a picture usually. But whatever you've created, they will tell you how to send them a deposit copy. And that's part of the deal. That's how the Library of Congress started their collection. A big chunk of it came from the bankruptcy of Thomas Jefferson, and a lot of it came from other guys who donated books. The rest of it came from, if you want a copyright, you guys send us a copy. And that's the original collection of the Library of Congress. We're in charge. We want a copy. It works. So file your copyright if it's something you care about. Because until you file it, you can't really enforce it. There are a lot of details of what you can and can't do when it's filed and not filed. If you want to really enforce your copyright and keep someone else from using your stuff, file it. It's 35 bucks. They, they, they've been saying they're going to raise it to 50. It might be 50 now. But seriously, 50 bucks for the whole work. It's not a huge price. Yes? Um, when you say files at the same time, registered? Yes. Okay. You file with the Copyright Office. Sorry about that. I'm changing terms. I, I'm a lawyer. I should be there that. When you file with the Copyright Office, you are registering your copyright. And you do it yourself. You pay the money. It's easy. Um, if you do have questions, they've got reference attorneys that will answer questions for you. Don't ask them for legal advice. Ask them, what is this for me? And they'll help you out. So that's our basic how you protect your copyright. What you're protecting is the other step. I've been teaching this for a long time, and I still use a really boring example from property law class. In property law, when we talk about owning dirt, um, you, they always talk, I mean, they're talking about dirt, so you know how excited the class is going to be. The height of wit is when they refer something as green acres and we start having, you know, music in the background. Um, <laughs> exactly. We all hum that. The professor goes, huh? What? Why are you singing? Because professors tend to lose their sense of humor very early. So you have the, um, what we refer to as the bundle of sticks. It's a stupid analogy, and I need a better one, but this is what we got. When I have written a book, I own a bundle of sticks. I own those rights to that book. Copyright gives me a specific rights. One of them, as one might expect from the name, is the right to copy. We knew that. So I, as long as I'm holding these sticks, no one else can legally make a copy of my work. There are other things no one else can do. No one else can make a derivative work of my book. A derivative work is when you take my work and make it different or into something else. It might be a sequel. It might be a translation, it might be a movie, it might be expressive dance. You know, whatever it is. It could be pop music redone as Ghostbusters. 
Well, that's just pirating. That's well, probably there, there's yeah. a copyright. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, music is copyrighted. Music is part of copyright also. I don't think I mentioned songs. Songwriters, you're kidding here too. Um, so if I, that's the right to make a derivative work. We're going to come back to this. So remember this part. Um, if I make a derivative work with my right, that is my right to do. No one else is allowed to do that. So if I write a book, you don't get to write a sequel to it. Mm -hmm. Very exceptional. Um, but so that's so that's one of my rights. Um, copying it, performing it, publishing it, um, changing it into a derivative work. All of those things belong to me. My bundle of sticks, and I'm holding them. But like a bundle of sticks, rather than just one big stick I could hit you with, which would be much more fun as a problem, I could give you individual sticks. If I give you the right to copy my work, I have not given you the right to write a sequel to it or to make a derivative work out of it. I have not given you the right to perform it. So if I am going to give you some rights to my work, one of the important things is to make sure I know what rights I'm giving and that you know what rights you're getting. Yes, normally it's a contract. Recently it's become a either open the box, um, straight wrap licenses, or click to agree stuff, which I know you didn't agree. Um, uh, but the, um, that's the whole point. That's why people love them. Well, people who are selling you stuff for them. Because we never do. But so you need to make sure you know what rights you're giving. If you are an artist, and, or if you, I mean, if you are. Okay, to hire someone to do cover art, or hire someone to do web design, or anything else where you're hiring an artist or you are the artist being hired, make sure both sides know what you're agreeing to. It's really common in web design, for instance, for the person who hired the web designer to think, I own this forever. And for the web designer to think, I'm going to use this exact same template and plug in another name for my next client. Well, that's only a problem if y'all didn't agree on that ahead of time. If you're not clear on what's, what you're hiring or what you're being hired to do, what happens later is what we call a lawsuit. And my people, in general, love lawsuits. I'm not a litigator, so I'm not one of the ones who benefits from a lawsuit. The only people, honestly, who benefit from lawsuits are litigators. Neither party usually wins. Every now and again, someone gets big, and it's great. But usually, the litigators get rich, everyone else gets frustrated, and that's why people hate us, I assume. I'm thinking it's not me. I'm assuming it's them. I like that better. I think that's why people pay lawyers. Um, I sleep better at night. So, know what you're giving away and know what you're getting. Because if you're doing any transaction with your work, you got to know. Now, in a perfect world, you will hire someone like me. Notice I said I'm not a litigator. Don't hire a litigator. All right. You're not going to hire your dermatologist to do your heart surgery, I hope. Not more than once. Um, your dermatologist knows more medicine than you do, except for my MDs there, I'm sorry. Um, the dermatologists went to med school. They know a lot of stuff, but they're really not heart surgeons. Well, I went to law school, so did the litigators, but I've spent 20 more years than I want to admit doing corporate law. I don't go to court. I don't litigate. I don't know how. So you hire her fair, so you're not a solicitor. That would be in England. We don't distinguish here. Um, in, uh, and none of us wear wigs. Seriously, it's fine here. Um, <laughs> But if you are, um, so you've got to know what's in the contract, hire a transactional attorney to write your contract, preferably one who does IP work. We all specialize down just like doctors do. About the time you think, oh, I bet that litigator that I talked to the other day would be able to write this contract, think about whether you want the dermatologist to do your heart surgery and you'll know where you're standing, okay? Now, if you're dying and the only person in the, around to do the surgery is the dermatologist or, oh, say, the copyright lawyer, yeah, get the dermatologist. Um, but you want a heart surgeon. Well, you want a transactional lawyer and you want one that does IP. That's the perfect world. That's an expensive world to live in. And it's hard to find sometimes. Most people who do good corporate work do it at really big law firms. I used to do that. I hated it. I left. But that's where most of us live and normal humans can't reach us there. It's way too expensive. Even baby associates start like 500 bucks an hour. That's your lawyer costs. Um, and that's not even the senior guys. In the real world, you may have to do without a lawyer. If you can, if you can hire a lawyer, please, that would be my best advice. Hire a good lawyer to write stuff that matters. If this is like the big work of your life, transactional IP lawyer to do the license for you. But in the real world, when you can't afford that, write your own. 
You're better <coughs> off doing that, obviously, than downloading crap off the internet. Because half of what's on the internet is just awful. And you will never know what it actually says. Because it's just been pieced together from six different things and no one, except someone like me who reads it and goes, holy crap, this is the same place, will understand what you're really agreeing to. Write it yourself. Write it in a letter. Don't rely on emails and stuff. Write it down, both of you sign it. Use complete sentences. Write it in very clear English. Don't try to sound like me. For the love of God, don't try to sound like lawyers. You know how when you know, parents, which sadly is like me, try to sound cool and hip like their kids? You know how stupid they sound? That's what you sound like if you try to sound like a lawyer. So don't do that. Write it in complete sentences. No bullet points. Bullet points aren't complete thoughts. You won't be finishing your ideas on the paper. Write down very clearly what you guys are agreeing to and both of you sign. That's not perfect, but it's better than the alternatives. Hey, can you come people? Use the requirements. Think about using the requirements. Think about what happens when you miss the requirement. That's what this is. Um, so, as you're thinking about what the other side and you are agreeing to, talk about it. Someone's hiring you to do artwork or hiring you to do web design. Don't just send an invoice. Find out what they think they're getting, because you don't want the lawsuit to come. If they think they're hiring you to do something that you don't think they're hiring you to do, someone's going to get pissed at the end of the transaction. If they get pissed before the end of the transaction, you're not getting paid. If they get pissed after the transaction, you might get sued, which is going to probably be more than you got paid. So work it out ahead of time. No one likes surprises. That's your transactional work for copyright for the day. In terms of what else is covered, I told you your ideas aren't covered. Some other things aren't covered. Facts. Facts are never covered by copyright. Functional things are not covered by copyright. Um, this is sort of pretty, I suppose. I don't have a really good example. Oh, no, I don't. I don't have a really good example of something with form and function. But as a general rule, if the form here were anything other than just a red bottle, I might be able to say the shape and the artistic nature of this is covered by copyright. The thermos part of this is not. So if you have form and function, your form may be covered by copyright. If it's a sculpture with a lamp, you know. The sculpture part of it, yes. The lamp part of it, no. So you can't cover function with your copyright. Yeah. What's the fact in this context? Hmm? Maybe it's a stupid question, but what's the fact in this context? Oh, fact? Well, see, that's always a good question. What is a fact? If I write a history book, the facts in my history book are not mine. If I make a great discovery, if I go and find where, um, I find where Elvis has been living for the past 30 years, and I find his actual tomb, because by now he is dead, and so I have found Elvis' tomb, I have found where he was living, I have found the banana plantation, and the peanuts that he was growing for the sandwiches he likes, I have found the entire Elvis enclave where he has been living, where he needed boats, for a number of years. I spent lots and lots of grant money to do this research. I spent years of my life. I have discovered this, and I wrote the book about really what happens to Elvis. If you want to, you can write all of those facts in your own book. All of that research I did, all of that work I did, I own none of it. What I own is how I wrote it. The words I use, so you can't copy my book and use it as your own, but you can take every single fact out of it and make your own book. And if you write it better than mine, you may make all the money while people forget about me. Citations. Life is not fair. Citations. Plagiarism is a different issue. Um, so, we are, so the facts are not covered. If I write a how-to book of any sort, how-to isn't going to be covered. How I tell you to do it will be. Okay? It's my expression. That's what's in copyright. So I said, we're not the science people, so if there's anything functional or useful, it's really not covered. This begins to get to why it's a stupid thing to use to cover code. Um, because code does stuff. Um, but that's a different issue. Different panel. <laughs> so we're gonna so we're talking about it's not facts, it's not function. None of that's gonna be incorporated into your copyright. So don't think that you can protect your discovery or your method or any of those things with your copyright. Your book may be great and informative, and a nonfiction book can be covered by copyright, but only your expression, not the facts in it.
And that's often a misunderstanding as well. Now, other things that do fall into the broader copyright thing are going to be things like characters. If I write a book or a movie, odd that I've talked about that here, with identifiable or memorable characters, those characters become part of my protected work, which tells us pretty quickly that fan fiction is a derivative work. It's making a story with pieces from the original story that someone owns. And I assure you, Lucas, well now Disney, is holding the sticks to Star Wars. They didn't give them to you to write a story. Mask notwithstanding the back there. Um, I've got stormtroopers staring at me. So I like these Star Wars Star Wars as an example. So you don't get to write fan fiction. You're not allowed to. That's the strict law. Okay, perhaps you're noticing that people do that anyway. That's where we sneak into fair use. <coughs> fair use, I'm gonna, we did a panel out the other day, so we're not doing huge details tonight, but I want to give you the very, the nitty gritty useful version of fair use rather than the interesting lawyer version of fair use. Yeah, don't rely on it. You don't know what fair use is until a judge tells you. And it costs you a lot of money to get to where, the point where the judge tells you. Fair use is actually an affirmative defense to an action for infringement. I walk around the, um, well, the country, not the planet, the country with a right to free speech. I have rights as a US citizen, and those rights walk around in a little dome with me. It's nice, it's a happy place to live. However, the right to, you, to use other people's copyright material is not in that happy little bubble of rights that I walk around with. That may be enough to get me out of trouble if someone sues me for infringement. It's not an absolute right. It might be enough to get you off the hook. Um, think of it as like um, killing someone in self-defense. Still not legal, not a good idea, but enough to get you off the hook for a murder rap, right? But that doesn't mean go out and kill someone and say, oh, it's self-defense, doesn't work that way. It's a defense against a charge of murder. So is fair use. Fair use has four factors. We went through them in the other panel. The big thing about them is you don't know what the judge is going to focus on and you don't know what the answer is going to be. Things that do matter is how the work is used, what the underlying work is, whether it's a commercial use is a big one. Just because you're not selling your fan art or your fan fiction does not mean it's legal for you to write it. It's worse if you sell it. But when you write that fan fiction, rest assured you are violating copyright law. Now, the good news is most of the content owners realize that the other word for fans and people who write fan fiction is people who purchase tickets. Um, so they tend not to really want to piss everyone off. And they have finally noticed that, oh, you mean all those weird Trekkies who wore all those funny clothes at conventions years after we canceled the series um, are keeping themselves excited and we can exploit that title further? Hey, let's make a movie. They realize that fans are good for them because we give them our money. We come to things like this so we can talk about how much we like them. I mean, come on, they're stupid if they stop and shut us down. So they usually don't. You will not see executive, you know, you won't see record or um, movie company lawyers stalking around the halls, finding people with unlicensed homemade costumes and, tell, and giving them cease and desist letters. You don't see that, not because they can't, but because they're not quite that stupid most days. <laughs> so if what you're doing is a happy use, and it's a personal use, and it's a small use, they probably won't care. That's as far as I'm going to tell you to rely on fair use. And it's really, are you small enough to fly under the radar? Honestly, those three things again, happy use. Um, happy use, um, you're supposed to be using it in a nice way, seriously. Don't wear it and do a strip tease. Don't sell yourself out to adult themed parties. Um, don't sell anything, because that's when they do start to get annoyed. And the more things you do that make yourself high profile, the more likely they are to notice what you're doing and make you stop. Usually fan fiction and everything else isn't so much allowed as beneath their notice. That's fine, it keeps us happy. So you know, keep writing your stories, keep drawing your art, keep making your costumes, they're fine with that. But you're technically violating copyright law. Now do you have a fair use? You might but it's really expensive to find out. And you have to be sued first, and that's just not fun. So 
relying on fair use is just really not wise, frankly. It's not practical. Now, if you're an activist, if you want to be that person making the test case, pushing the envelopes, making the arguments, great. Um, look back to who was on the panel for fair use with me the other day. Uh, there are lots of them who do that, and they will talk to you about it, and they will love that, and it's wonderful. But I kind of take the more pragmatic view to it, which is, seriously, you don't want to have to hire litigators. Try not to color outside the lines in a way that's going to get you in trouble. Commercial is not determinative, but if you sell it, they get more angry. Even if you don't sell it, you are still violating the law. Like I said, fair use is just squishy. It's hard to predict, and it's not going to go where you think it is. Now, fair use has gotten even stranger. So remember when I was talking about derivative works? That's my right to make a sequel, or to write fan fiction. Um, my right to do change my work in some way. Now, when you're talking especially about art, you know, graphic art, and music especially now also, the way we interact with this media has changed, I'm told, by people cooler than I am. That this is how you know, we react, we interact digitally, we interact with art. We no longer just look at it and go, oh, pretty. We no longer just listen to songs and go, yeah, it's got a good beat. I can dance to it, I'll give it a name. That's not what we do anymore. We apparently steal it and cut it and change it and make it into our own. But I start by saying we steal it. When you take that work of whoever it was that did it the first time and you mash it up into something else, you cut it, you paste it, you chop it into something different, you started by stealing their work. Now, is that a fair use? Maybe. But you started by taking something. And what I always find funny is the same people who will come to me and say, well, I do this and I'm a brilliant visual artist. And I was like, well, you're stealing that stuff to start to be brilliant. Um, but as soon as they have created something, then, oh, boy, how do you let me tell you nothing fair use likes going to apply to their work. No one better be taking their work and doing anything to it because that's stealing. Yeah, fair use is usually what they call it when they want to use something and infringement and stealing is what they call it when someone has done it to them. And it's really funny when the same people use both terms depending on whether they're stealing or being stolen from. It's really hypocritical. I love it. Um, there are a couple of artists who are very famous. Um, Shepard Ferry, the um, Obey giant thing who did the Obama art, um, is notorious for that. He is a, just an outright thief. But he is what we call a frequent consumer of legal goods. Um, boy, howdy. He will steal from you in a heartbeat. If there's something he thinks is interesting, he will take it, steal it, use it, change it, sell it. And if anyone looks at his work twice, he's hiring lawyers already to go after him. Huge hypocrite. But made a lot of litigators rich. And people respect him as an artist. Okay. That has been the upfront basics. There's more I can get into, but I want to start and see what questions do we have right now. We've got a couple. Let's hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. We have to do the official orange box thing. I know better. So, <clears throat> one of the original things you talked about was going to copyright dot gov. Gov. Yes. Uh, and you can. And you can submit your information to them. They keep a copy. Yes. So let's say I'm doing a statue or a sculpture or painting, mm -hmm. and someone else independent of me sends a picture of a very similar statue or sculpture or picture. We didn't excellent know each other. Question. It's not derivative at that point, yeah, is no, it? Excellent so. question. Copyright is very limited in that way. Um, if you're thinking of patent law, where the first one with the patent owns the process, if I discover a way to um, cure a certain kind of cancer in a certain kind of rat, which is most of the case these days. Um, and I pack that. I can keep anyone else from doing what I discovered, whether they had any idea about my work or not. I own that process no matter what. Copyright is completely different. In copyright, if two of us write the exact same novel, both are protected. It doesn't matter who filed it first, as long as both of them were independently created. So two pieces of identical work can be covered by copyright. For a patent, you have a required novelty and originality, and they check to make sure you're the first one to do it. Yeah, sorry, I don't do a great job of that, but that's the theory. Um, with copyright, the only requirement there is creativity has to be an independent creation. It doesn't have to be real original. It doesn't have to be good. It doesn't have to be to the extent it's original, it only has to be original in that you made it yourself, you didn't copy it from someone else. 
so that little stick figure drawing that I do, of course, is not as soon as I draw it practically since third grade. It now is identifiable most days, of course. Um, but yet, yeah, most of my professional artists, I saw this. In the art show, I didn't even want That's like a you know, jury show. Um, my professional. I was in the ledger. I sold art. I'm professional. That's the definition. I traded my artwork for money. I am a professional artist. So, um, that stick figure is validly copyrighted. And so it doesn't have to be good or original. I can't keep anyone else from doing a very similar stick figure. I can't keep someone else from doing an identical stick figure as long as they're not copying mine. They can't copy mine either with a Xerox or a camera or by looking at it and copying it. They can't do that to my artwork. But they can, someone who said, hey, I'm gonna draw a really bad pony. They're allowed to. I can't keep anyone else from creating the same thing as long as they're not actually copying mine. So like I said, if two of us wrote two novels, I live in Georgia, I wrote mine, someone in New York wrote one, word for word identical, start to finish. We can both have a copyright, doesn't matter who falls first. So just kind of... That would be weird. And yeah, there'd be lots of follow-up questions that make great exam questions for law students, but there's no originality requirement beyond I did not copy it. Yeah, it just seems a little hard to kind of protect your copyright at that point if someone else can submit almost a, a fair copy of yours. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, to prove infringement, there's a couple stages you go through. One of them is usually access. If you write, I mean, if I, if you write the great American novel and keep it in the desk drawer, realistically, the file the computer, it's more computer, here's more visual. If you keep it in the drawer of your desk, no one's going to be able to copy it. So if you try to sue someone else for infringing it, you're going to have a hard time proving it because they never saw it. But if it's word for word, then they must have seen it. No. Enough monkeys with typewriters will write Shakespeare. No one has ever quite managed to do identical novels. But, you know, people come pretty close. There have been a whole lot of derivations of Romeo v. Juliet, you know. Um, and it's most modern literature, one would think. So, <clears throat> yes, it's hard to, in many ways, have to be meaningful. The wider yours is promulgated, the more likely you are to win at that. But copyrights? Pushy protection. Okay, I have to go with whoever's the orange box. The orange box is oh, speaking. The orange box. Can we kind of talk about Creative Commons licenses and how to navigate sure. those? That's uh, great. That's they're a little more fickle. Um, Creative Commons license is the exception to my rule of don't believe anything on the internet and for the love of God never download an agreement. Uh, the Creative Commons license is done by actual lawyers who have, I mean, they have a bet. They have a goal and their goal is kind of this weird grassroots undermining of copyright law. But it's neat in that they don't say, we want to change or violate the copyright law. They say, hey, remember that bundle of sticks that I was talking about so boring? Here are some sticks, take them. When you publish something under Creative Commons license, there's a, um, so there's a summary at the front of it, if you look on their site. The summary, or the human readable form, I think it's the Salmon version that they call it. But if you look at the summary, it's actually accurate. It's written in English, and you can rely on it. The guys who wrote this are good. They don't write exactly how I would write it, but you know, what can you expect? Um, the licenses allow you to share your work in a way that other people can use it, and you set the rules. Um, one of them is you can use it as long as you get as long as you have attribution, as long as you say it's mine. You can use my work any way you want to, as long as you put my name on it and say, "Hey, he's the one who made this." Another one says you can use it as long as you give attribution and your use is non-commercial. There's one that says, "Hey, take it, use it however you want." There are various levels of the licenses, and they're all pretty straightforward. They're all legally binding. Because you're not saying, hey, the copyright doesn't apply to you. What you're saying is, hey, you know that bundle of sticks I'm holding? Any of you who run across my work, you can have these three sticks. And you're allowed to do that. It's enforceable. And it's actually really well written. And it's a neat way for the people who, you know, I talk about thieves and stealing people's art and that sort of thing. But a lot of people honestly do want to share. And they say, I'm putting stuff out here. I want to use your stuff. I want you to use mine. And the people who feel that way often release under Creative Commons licenses. It's an excellent thing to use if you want to be part of that. Hey, I want to use your stuff. I want you to use mine. Let's all be creative together. Yeah. Uh, Wait, he, he, I didn't quite finish his question. It was just, uh, like, let's say you dish out those sticks. Uh huh. And let's say you change your mind out you like, you know what? I don't want to share my sticks anymore. Oh, see, that's a catch. Can um, you come back and retroactively? 
treat them per se, or is it once they're out, they're out? Well, that's actually an interesting question I've asked that on exams. It's a fun question. The basic answer is going to be, if I've said those sticks, if I've freely said take and use, these are my sticks, you can use them. And if I say, wait, 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 give me my sticks back. I can't make you give me my sticks back. What I can do is say, no one else can have any of these sticks. I can say, going forward, this work is protected. But anyone who already is using it, I can't make them stop because they have the right to do it. The Creative Commons license doesn't say until I change my mind. Can you just stop distribution of said sticks by second party then? You can stop other people from taking your sticks, but the people who already have your sticks get to keep them. Okay. Orange box guy. Yeah, hi. Um, I had a question. So copyright eventually expires, uh, yes. right? And so. Uh, some works are coming out this year out of copyright that are going to the public domain, including some corporate assets. Uh, I think Mickey Mouse is a big example that everybody's been talking about, original Mickey Mouse. Oh, right, right. so that's what, that was my question. It's like, what, what kind of law, how does the law cover these cases with corporate ownership, and what are we looking, what are corporate some of the different? Corporate ownership has a separate term. Um, it was different under older law, so the old ones like that you're talking about are a mishmash of multiple terms, which you know, I could sit down and we could work it out on paper, but it has to do with when it was copyrighted, when the new law took effect, when the extensions of the new law took effect, and um, what the face of the moon is. But again, excellent exam questions. I enjoy giving those for answering the sucks. But um, with the really big stuff like Mickey Mouse, you can assume that you are never going to be allowed to do something with Mickey Mouse because their lawyers are too smart for that. Even if the copyright expires, the character is a trademark by this point. It represents Disney. And their lawyers, even if they start losing cases, they have a lot of money, and they will come after you anyway and bankrupt you before you get to the point that you can prove that you were actually right. I would not take on Mickey Mouse under any circumstances. I would not take on Coca-Cola under any circumstances because they have lots of money and lots of incentive to protect their stuff. Um, now, the Steamboat Willie cartoon that Mickey Mouse appears in, that one sporadically keeps running up against copyright deadlines, and it's supposed to expire. Um, if you've noticed, there have been a few extensions of the Copyright Act, which have coincidentally been just about the time that Steamboat Willie was about to expire. Um, coincidence. But, I mean, come on. People badmouth Disney for that, but if you had something that valuable, wouldn't you do what you could to keep your exploitation of it? You made it. It's yours. Um, and so that's how they feel about it. Why would we let this asset go out to the great unwashed when we could keep it? So they're just protecting their stuff, like all of us do. They're just really good at it, because they have lots of resources. Um, so eventually the copyright on some of those underlying things will expire. And once they do, yeah, it's free to use. Um, the Tarzan novels, it's kind of fun. No, it's, it, um, the Tarzan novels are in the public domain now, but some of the later works are not. James Bond is fun because a few of the very early ones are in the public domain. Most of the later ones are not, but you can't use the screenplays. You have to go back to the original novels because those are sort of what fell into the public domain, just a few of them at this point. But if it is fallen into public domain, you can use it. You can write a James Bond novel as long as you're only using stuff from the public domain novels. Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain, but don't be using the BBC version in your book, because that's not. What they have changed, what they have added onto it, that they, they hold a copyright in. When you make a derivative work, like if you write the sequel or whatever, you don't get any rights in the first work. So writing a sequel doesn't extend your copyright in your first book, but whatever you've added in your sequel, that has its own copyright extending forward. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Orange box. All right. Um, I want to make sure I understand the intent of something I believe you said earlier. That was uh, for contracts, uh, instead of like having emails back and forth, uh, that you write it all down in complete sentences and sign it together. Was yes. there a particular int um, There's a reason for okay. that. It's nothing to do with particular legal requirement. Okay. This is not because if you rely on emails, it's not enforceable. I mean, you can pull those up, but this is going to take lawyers and judges to sort okay. out. If you sit down in the room with the other person, I realize it's not always possible, but the best you can, or at least talk. The, the devices all of y'all are carrying, they have voice technology. Try it. It's helpful. You can't do business by text and email. You just can't. People don't understand each other. You think you're doing business, and then you disagree on crap. If you can sit in the same room, that's best. At least talk on the phone. Talk through in English with each other what you think you're agreeing to. And then write it down. Don't try to sound like a lawyer. We already had that conversation. 
don't use bullet points because that's just enough to jog your memory of what you said. Two years from now, you won't remember. And two years from now, you both are going to be in a dispute over something. And let me tell you, suddenly your recollection is going to suit your side of the argument, and his recollection is going to suit his side of the argument. And those three words in the bullet point aren't clear enough. Write it out in a complete sentence. This isn't a legal rule. This is just the best way I have come up with to give you guys some good advice that doesn't require thousands of dollars of legal services. So write it out in English. I mean, for love of God, if you wrote a book, you could write a sentence. Um, if you're drawing, you know, do it the best you can. But complete sentences, subjects, verbs, periods, commas, all that stuff. That stuff you learned in grammar school, use it. Write the complete thought out, and both of you read it in plain English, agree that this is what you mean, and sign it. What you're mainly doing, honestly, is avoiding the fight. Because everyone's agreeing to this, and then if we look back, let's think, wait, am I allowed to do this? And you look at this very clearly worded thing that one of you wrote in English and both of you signed, and you go, oh yeah, either I can or I can't. And you're avoiding the fight by not having someone surprised or someone trying to decide what it means after we're on opposite sides of it. The time to make agreements about terms is before you know which side you're on. <laughs> now, obviously, if you're the artist and they're using your work, you know which side you're on. But in five years, does it revert to you? You may care, you may not care. Who owns the copyright? You may care, you may not care, but they may care. If neither of you cares today, one of you may care in five years. If both of you agree now, then you don't have to fight about it in five years. I'm trying to avoid fights. That was why I made the specific requirements, because that's not a legal requirement, that's just the practical thing I've come up with, aside from, wow, you really need to hire a lawyer. Because when I tell you that and you can't, you don't need to download stuff. Yeah. And that's not the right answer. This is better than anything you can download. Unless you want a Creative Commons license, those are excellent and free. Okay, Orange Box. How, how international are the copyright laws? that you're talking about, or the what you've been talking about today? like um, The Bern Convention is the international convention. We are now in compliance with Bern, so most of this applies internationally, but not exactly, is the answer. It's going to depend on the country. And I can tell you most of the Bern signatories, but I don't know it specifically, so you have a specific question. The big thing is look it up and see if, there's, if they signed the Bern Convention. If so, then all the rules are pretty much the same. But the Bern Convention does not mean that U.S. laws apply in all the Berm countries. It means all the Berm countries' laws have to have a minimum set of requirements. So foreign law applies to foreign publications. But there's squishy caveats to that. All right, crazy scenario question. So oh, good. I'm Are doing we on the moon? Is there uh, gravity? There Are there aliens? <laughs> all of those things. <laughs> so I'm doing something. Someone takes a picture of me, puts it on Facebook, um, can I share that picture? Who owns who owns that? Where were you and what were you doing when they took the picture? Uh, were I, you in I'm, a public place? I'm in Dragon Con. I'm You're in Dragon Con. Someone took a picture of you sitting in the best panel you have ever sat on. Right. right. And it was right now someone took your picture. Excellent. Can they put that on Facebook? Hell yes, they can. You're in a public place. Yeah. You have no expected rights to privacy. Oh, there we go. He's <laughs> no, make sure you post it. You post it with the picture of me in the coat. It's going up now. Sweet. Um, okay. Can you then go copy his picture off of Facebook because it's of you? No. Um, can you copy something off of Facebook? It's going to do what Facebook rules are. Yeah. If I take a picture, I own that picture. I am the author and the copyright belongs to me. The fact that you're in it is irrelevant unless you have some action against me for taking it when I ought to have taken it. What so you might be able to make me not publish the photo, or you might be able to sue me for damage that I didn't publish the photo, which is usually where it comes out. Um, but you can't own the photo because you're in it. What if what I was doing was a performance? Well, in the olden days, back before these devices, she said, let me get my cane and lean on it. We used to keep people from bringing cameras into performances. And you all remember when people weren't allowed to bootleg concerts? I used to work security and we searched for recorders, but that was before they were you know, this big. And everyone carried them anyway. Now, you know, it used to be only the Grateful Dead allowed people to bootleg their concerts. It's a big deal because there's this whole little forest of antenna because they let anyone report. And that was really unusual. They were like the original Creative Commons guys. Yeah, That's just fine recorded. In fact, you know what? The sound sucks over there in the corners. Come set up your official stuff and do it right here in front of us where the sound is good. And so people brought a, you know really professional sound equipment and it really did look like a little forest of antennas in front of the state. Not that I would like to bring <laughs> um, 
but the Grateful Dead allowed it. They gave those sticks away at a time when most performers literally had people at the gates trying to keep you from bringing recording devices in. Now, technically, they probably are still not allowed to do that without permission, but the bottom line has become those phones are ubiquitous and no one has a meaningful way to keep them from being used. So does the law say they're not allowed to take a picture of your performance of your copyrighted work? Arguably, depending on details that have to do with the mood and gravity. Um, but assuming that you are performing a copyrighted work, your performance is protected, I'm just being recorded for the um, they don't have a right to take a picture of you in that performance. Yeah, good luck with that. Everyone's got a camera with them right now. I assure you, um, when I started doing these speeches a very long time ago, no one had a picture, had a camera in their pocket. Some people had cameras with them. No one had, you know, little pocket brains that could do everything. So the expectations have changed. And technically, you still have that right to your performance, but good luck. Some people stop um, flash photography so that the animals or the or the actors don't get scared. Um, so a little bit of a two-part, I guess. Uh, when it comes to anthology work that is not your own, you're creating an anthology of other authors, does that fall back more into the category of just making sure that contract is very clear about, hey, this is what you're allowed to do with the work I'm, I'm submitting? I the authors know you're doing it. Yes, okay. yes, you've got permission to do so, it. So, so you've you're got just, permission yes. to do this. Then, yeah, you need to have made sure that they understand what you're using it for. Are they allowed to use that story elsewhere? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you allowed to publish a second edition with some of these stories, but okay. not all of them? What are you allowed to do? How long okay. are you allowed to do it? Those are important questions. And there's not a copyright answer to that. It's what did y'all agree to? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the other question um, falls more in line with uh, things like cookbooks, I guess, and the form and functionality mm -hmm. aspect. What of that would be copyrightable and what is kind of more a public domain? is not protected. Mm -hmm. There are only so many ways I can tell you to make cookies. Um, <laughs> But um, the basic recipe is a set of instructions. That's not protectable. Coding people should be going, well, uh, because that's what you write and it's protected. So again, okay, that's a different panel. It's stupid to have your stuff in copyright. But I will go back to the standard copyright law, which is a series of directions is not copyrightable. <laughs> Software is copyrightable. For recipes, no, the recipe is not protectable any more than um, the lather, or wet hair, mm -hmm. lather, rinse, repeat. Mm -hmm. That may need to be there for certain members of our population, mm -hmm. but it's not copyrighted. Mm -hmm. It's instructions, there's only so many ways you can say it, and you're not really expressing anything creatively. Mm -hmm. Sorry, others. Um, but the, <laughs> but so the instructions are not, however, if I, the recipes that I gather together to put in a cookbook, my selection, of those recipes, my arrangement of those recipes, that can be protected. Now, the way you're arranging the recipes is usually into, you know, like groupings, you know, like main dishes, appetizers, desserts. You don't own that. Mm -hmm. But the the whole cookbook that you make is lightly protected. What's protected is your choice and your selection and your arrangement. Mm -hmm. The actual directions in there are not protected because sets of instructions are not protected. Hi. Um, I have a specific experience. My, I am a Google beta tester, and um, in doing so, uh, I did not give up my right to my uh, data or the base uh, of my content. Uh, but I have released that because I was being hacked and I'm one of those guys to die. Um, that was specific. With Facebook and Twitter, they don't own my content. I use Facebook for business and Twitter for business. Post on Facebook, actually they do own your content. Well, for Facebook for business, they don't own my process. If I, I can still copyright it because I did write it. Twitter, I can still copyright it because I did write it. Going to determine, is going to depend on the distinct details <coughs> of your agreement with Facebook, and I have not memorized well, the terms. Well, I'm telling you, based on the terms of service, they, they actually don't, okay? That's contrary to the current terms of service. 
But if, if indeed they do not own what you have posted, then yes, you can file it. Mm -hmm. you are, if you wrote it first, you are already protected by copyright. Mm -hmm. I understand. And so, and so you can file that copyright. Okay. And if indeed you did not give that right. to Facebook, then yes, you can. Okay, but so. see, with Facebook and, and Twitter, they give me the opportunity to also get copies of that content. They have a, a thing called Storybook, and I've contacted them, and they take all your content, and they make a book out of it. Okay. And I've asked them, I just want the raw data, and there's a, you know, there's, a, there's a process for that. I have some other forums I'm on where there hasn't ever been an agreement. I'm not going to be able to Oh, I'm just this. saying. I'm sorry, because that's yeah. all going to be determined by exactly what terms you have agreed to, and I don't know them. I'm, so going, I'm not going to be able to answer that. I'm going to file it, and then we'll see. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I, uh, this just occurred to me uh, from that previous fellow's question about uh, uh, corporate uh, Mickey Mouse and stuff. Uh, are you better off copywriting on your own or incorporating and having uh, your own Corporation Usually it's it. better for you just to file the copyright yourself. You have a more direct protection and you have a longer term. Um, the so term your, your personal is longer term? Usually, unless you die really soon. <laughs> um, it has, it's like Sam plus 70. Um, so it's going to, usually you are better off filing individually and then you can license your work to that corporation, especially if you are forming a corporation to either form, formal with it further promulgate your work or as an asset protection shield or anything like that, it's usually, usually a better answer for you to own the copyright and for you to license the copyright to the corporation. It's a couple different layers of protection and it's a couple different layers. It's usually better both for taxes and for legal protection. For taxes, please ask the tax guy because I'm often wrong. My tax accountant laughs at me a lot when I tell her what I understand about taxes. She's like, that's cute. No, excuse me. Um, quit trying to play, just give me that stuff and I'll tell you what you've done. Um, so, but usually it's better for you to own it, is the short answer. The specific ones would be a long conversation. So to piggyback off his question, which I'm glad you asked because I was thinking kind of like the same thing. Um, what if you own that business? Is it still better for you personally to it's own it? It's usually better for you to own the copyright. It's cleaner, it's easier, and if something happens to that corporation, you still have the copyright. Okay. Um, if you want to dissolve it later and use your work another way, it's easier if it's your work. If someone sues your corporation and tries to take all of the corporation's assets, well, that's an asset of theirs only under the license. They can't get the actual right to the copyrights as yours. So you're safer usually if you own the right and you license it to your corporation, even if it's your own corporation. For a lot of business reasons, really, which aren't necessarily copyright, and usually your term is longer if it's um, an individual, but not always. Seriously, that's to do with actuarial tables. That is your, what you need to know. Yes. Okay. Orange box. Yes. Um, um, a songwriter hasn't released music commercially yet <laughs> because of all this copyright whoop de do and it's true, is it true that you can't copyright chord progressions? Mm. Right now, music copyright is just a bloody mess. Um, any girl who's familiar with the Blurred Lines case oh, yeah. is just wow. an absolute stupid nightmare. That totally it was Marvin Gaye. Um, <laughs> well, the funniest thing is, if you, when juries listen to those two pieces, it's um, Blurred Lines and I forget which of the Marvin Gaye songs. You get to give it up. Uh, yeah, got to give it up. Um, his, art, his song was recorded with some kind of crowd noise in the background, a lot of cowbells. Um, so it was Blurred Lines. But because of the weird situation after Marvin Gaye's death, all of the rights to his songs have kind of splittered into warring camps. I mean, when this started with someone, someone in the family shooting. So it ends badly for the executors of the estate. But the people who are suing the Blurred Lines folks only own the sheet music, the written form of the music. Not the, I, when I record this, I put in crowd noise and cowbells. Nevertheless, Marvin Gaye's estate won. So, and it was a stupid opinion. The um, Led Zeppelin opinion is just as bad. There was some obscure piece of music that no one on the planet had heard, and if you twist your head just right, the chord progressions 
of this piece that I can't even remember the name of um, is somewhat similar to the intro to Stairway to Heaven. Seriously, I'm not saying someone stole Stairway to Heaven, it's that Stairway to Heaven stole something else a million years ago. Um, and there's a point where you do say, come on, there's only so many chords and so many ways to combine them. The Axis of Awesome um, four chord song video is a hoot where they play the same four chords and then play every song you've ever heard of and it's the exact same four chords. It's lovely. Um, so to an extent, if it's just a short chord progression, you can't meaningfully, but any music you want to write down, you can protect. It's just a matter of whether that protection really is meaningful. So there's not a rule that you can't protect chord progressions, but right now, it is in a huge state of uproar because of a couple of really expensive, really bad decisions. People right now are afraid that no one can own anything musically. And that no one can write anything musically because apparently someone else owns the G chord. You know, it's scary because I don't know what this is, what's going to happen here. The pendulum's got to swing back or no one's going to be writing music because they're all going to be spend all their lives in court. We are at time, but I actually do have two more questions from people in the audience. You want to keep going? Yeah, or? don't let me. I'll do it. Scott says yes. Let's do it. All right. There you go. This is uh, just a quick question. I watch a lot of, uh, for example, TV or movie reaction videos on YouTube where the YouTube video is monetized, but they will have a crowd reaction and then a little timer very carefully cutting down 10 oh, yeah, minutes. Oh, that's cute, but it's bullshit. Okay, that's, that was my question. Is there that's such right. a 10 minute rule no. for fair use? No. Um, people think there is, and you'll see a lot of disclaimers on YouTube, this is a fair use of someone else's material. I am not committing infringement by virtue of putting this disclaimer on my thing. You know, I can steal your car and say, I'm not stealing your car. And you know, it doesn't change anything. I can leave a disclaimer where I took your car from saying, I have removed your vehicle, but I am not stealing your car. It doesn't change the fact that I stole your car. Um, there's a lot of stupid people who think they understand copyright law. I started with that and I'll put that back out there now. Um, they put those cute little timers in because somewhere there's a corporate guidance that said that. YouTube for a while was suggesting that was a good rule of thumb or something like that. What fair use, what the fair use rule actually for that kind of thing is, is that I can use small but necessary amounts of the TV show or the book in my criticism or my reporting of that book or TV show. So if I want to say this was the, you know, if I want to write a review of a television show, I can use pieces of the television show in my review. I can't show the episode. I can use little snippets to an extent. What extent? Yeah, it depends. That's where we get into squishy fair use issues. But if I use a little bit of a big book, I can, you know, if you're reading literary criticism, you expect to read a few paragraphs of a novel, right? You don't expect to read paragraph or chapters and chapters of that novel that's being criticized. There are some thoughts of 10 minutes or something like that, but what if the show I'm doing is a 30 minute show? What if it's a two hour show? Is it still 10 minutes? That doesn't make any sense. Um, there's also a different aspect of fair use that that timer ignores completely, which is the substantiality of the portion used. Um, the example is Gerald Ford's memoirs. This is the Supreme Court case. Oh, yeah. Gerald Ford, who was interested, in, it was interesting to the rest of the world in large part because he pardoned Nixon, mm -hmm. wrote his memoirs. He's actually very was a very intelligent and interesting man. His memoirs were really thick. After I'm gone, right? And the only thing that anyone at the time when he wrote them was really interested in was the Watergate part. You may have to Google that. Those of you who are young. Um, but they, um, but that was the part that they were really interested in. Well, someone stole his manuscript, which started out making it bad, and published that chapter. Well, it was like 30 pages out of 2,000, so it's less than 10 minutes equivalent, but it was the only part that anyone cared about. And so his book sales were crap, because everyone had read it for free. Well, bought the magazine and published it. That magazine lost the suit because they used the only good part. So that 10-minute rule and the other stuff that people post on YouTube, no. There was one more. Yes. Last question. Yes. So um, I don't know very much about the process of publishing a novel, but my impression is that a lot of writers will create a manuscript mm -hmm. and submit it to the publisher, and then work with the publisher to edit it to get a final product. Yes. 
So are writers copywriting the manuscript that they submit to the publisher and that protects it throughout the entire editing process? Like, I, I just was wondering how that works. By virtue of having created your manuscript, you own the copyright to it. It is usually best practice to go ahead and when you have a finished product, file it. Now, some publishers want to own your copyright. The only thing that they legally can do is have you license all rights to them. They can't be the author. You are the author and that can't change. But if it's correct, if I create it, I'm the author. The, text, the first textbook that I published was by a really big publishing house. I'm an adjunct, um, so I'm not important. And it was my first book deal. Yeah, the terms suck. I knew that, I read it. But I could get a better deal. Lexus owns the copyright to my book. But when I say own the copyright, I have licensed all of my rights to Lexus. I no longer functionally own the words I wrote. Eventually, by virtue of copyright law, I can get it back. That's like 35 years later if I jump through legal hoops. But um, there's statutes about that. But I can license all of my rights to them, and meaningfully, they own it. So we would talk loosely that Lexus owns my work now. And in some publishing contracts, especially for first authors, that's not uncommon. In fiction, it's a little bit more uncommon to see that, but it comes down to if you want to get published, sometimes you got to do what they say, but you can always register it first, and that protects your rights and the rights of the manuscript, and it formalizes what they're going to get, what you're going to give to them anyway. So you recommend copyright the manuscript before you submit it to the public? I would, just to make sure, look, I've done this, the copyright's filed, it exists, and they can still make you give them all of your rights, mm -hmm. but they couldn't own more than you can give them anyway. They cannot be the author. Some, like, indie publishing houses and stuff, write stuff in their forms that make it sound like they're the author of the book. Legally, that's not possible. Mm -hmm. You're always the author, page may have all the meaningful rights. Thank you. Okay, that was our two questions over time. Thank you. Don't forget to rate us on the air. Yes, if right. you liked it, if you thought this sucked, please don't rate us. <laughs>